God is with us. Good morning and welcome to First Church of Christ in Simsbury. Uh, what a delight to enter on that music. As soon as Kevin and I stepped off, the music began and I didn't know whether to saunter or sachet or uh, <laughs> what was the appropriate stride, but it just all, uh, I felt it all in my, go through my whole body. So uh, welcome. Those of you who are worshiping in person this morning, welcome. Those of you who are worshiping at home, uh, I have been blessed to be off for a couple Sundays over the last couple months, and um, I've learned that I can tune in from my car, I can tune in from a hotel room, uh, and it's all good. And it brings us right into the middle of worship with one another. So I'm grateful for all of that especially like to acknowledge those who help make all this possible on a Sunday morning. I am Pastor George Harris. I'm joined by my uh, brother and friend and colleague, Reverend Kevin Weichel. You heard Maestro Mark Mercier and Jim Martoccio. Uh, but there's others who do uh, things that often go unacknowledged. Our facilities manager, Ardell McGee, uh, really makes it happen, and not just the initial setup, but there's a lot of last minute details on a Sunday morning that he chases down. Uh, this morning we are joined, Tom Palizzi, the one who's often at the computers and the sound is off this morning. Uh, and Bob and Cindy Bromlick have stepped in as volunteers and are very, I'm very, very grateful for them. I was feeling nostalgic because right at the very beginning of COVID, when we first started going online and Annie Petiti and Jessica Wolanin were staffing the computers and it would be right in front of Kevin and I and something would go wrong and you'd see it in their faces and there'd be this rushing around and there'd be this kind of panicked look and Kevin and I would just be asked to like act like nothing was happening and we would just have to go plow right ahead and I was sharing that story with Bob and Cindy this morning and I said it's lucky because you're behind me so I, if anything go, and they'd say yep just plow ahead just plow ahead so um, thank you guys they, they, they really trained extensively for this and so I know it's going to go very smoothly also like to acknowledge our usher team um, again small things I saw Ashley Schwitter this morning uh, getting gluten-free communion elements for one of our members in worship this morning. And that's just a reminder to all of you, if, there, uh, if, if you would like that or need that, you just flag down one of the ushers and we have something for you. So this is Pentecost Sunday. I will be talking more about that in my sermon so I don't have to go into it extensively here, often associated with the birth of the church, uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit. It's associated with wind and fire, so hence the, the red that Rev. Kevin and I are wearing, and you'll see um, a few in red in the congregation who remembered and keep track of such things, so, so well, well done, well done. We don't always catch it early enough to make a big thing of it, but I uh, always appreciate those who do. Um, we are an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey. You are welcome here. Now, if you would, Join me in a moment of prayer. God of wind and fire, embolden us this day to receive your power. Help us to proclaim the wondrous things that you have done and continue to do in our lives. Give us strength and courage to share the good news of your love and your presence. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. I invite you to rise on your feet or in your heart and join me in today's call to worship. Come, Holy Spirit, ignite our hearts with joy and confidence. For God has done wondrous things for us. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us with the power of the rushing wind that we may faithfully serve you in all that we do. For Christ has called each of us. Come, Holy Spirit, be with us today. Help us to boldly proclaim Christ risen. Amen. Amen. more signs, more proof, more evidence that God loves us. Yet all we have to do is what Jesus did, trust in God completely, foolishly, daringly. So let us pray, telling God how hard such trust is for us, hoping that God's gracious spirit will dance in our hearts. Holy Spirit, we're not sure we're ready for your awesome power to blow through our lives. We're grown comfortable with our familiar habits and bland routines. We're afraid to give up our waking slumber and face the truth that we do not truly live. When we cling to our ways and the safety of familiar paths, wake us up, shake us up, heat us up, and breathe your life into us. Walk with us, O oh God, and give us the courage to follow the way that is lit by the fire of your spirit. On this day of Pentecost, we pray for the audacity to ride the winds of change.
hear that the good news is for us. God pours the Spirit upon us in these moments, the Spirit which comforts us, which encourages us, which transforms us through God's grace. Thanks be to God, the Spirit brings peace, comforts our hearts, and fills us with hope. We are forgiven and made new. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from Acts 2, verses 1 to 13, and it describes the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there was a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each one of them. 
all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every people under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one of them heard speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. May God bless the reading of these holy words. Before I begin, I just have to say, Miss Nicole Jackson, you killed that reading. I wished you had a handheld mic so you could have done a mic drop at the end of it. <laughs> the list of all those nations are notoriously uh, challenging and you didn't miss a beat, so well done. So let's begin with a little name that tune. You know, the game show. I'm going to ask Mark to play the first notes of a familiar melody and ask you to name that tune. Wait. What are the rules? Should we do a raise your hand or shout out the answer? I'm with you. I'm with you. We're going to shout out the answer. It's more chaotic. It'll be in keeping with this Pentecost theme of fire and wind and all that. So we'll do the, we'll do the shout out. OK. Mark? Okay, there you go, there you go. So, so what's the song? Sound of, Sound of Silence, and what's the lyric? Hello darkness, my old friend. Well done, well, not enough people to do it, knew it to create chaos, but yeah, well, well, well done, well done. It's such a well-known melody and lyric, but do you know the story behind it? Maybe some do, I didn't. I just came across this just the other day. It began 62 years ago, when Arthur Art Garfunkel, a Jewish kid from Queens, enrolled at Columbia University. During freshman orientation, Art met a student from Buffalo named Sandy Greenberg, and they became lifelong friends. They bonded over their shared passion for literature and music. They became roommates, best friends, and with the idealism of youth, they promised to be there for each other no matter what. Soon after starting college, Sandy was struck by tragedy. His vision became blurry, and although doctors diagnosed it as temporary conjunctivitis, the problem grew worse. 
Finally, after seeing a specialist, Sandy received the devastating news that he had severe glaucoma that was destroying his optic nerve. The young man with such a bright future would soon be completely blind. Sandy was devastated and fell into a deep depression. He gave up his dream of becoming a lawyer and moved back home to Buffalo, where he worried about being a burden to his financially struggling family. Consumed with shame and fear, Sandy cut off contact with his old friends, refusing to answer letters or return phone calls. Then suddenly, to Sandy's shock, his buddy Art showed up at his front door. He was not going to allow his best friend to give, on, give up on life. So he bought a ticket and flew up to Buffalo unannounced. Art convinced Sandy to give college another try and promised that he would be right by his side to make sure he didn't fall, literally and figuratively. Art kept his promise, faithfully escorting Sandy around campus and effectively serving as his eyes. It was important to Art that even though Sandy had been plunged into a world of darkness, he should never feel alone. Art actually started calling himself darkness to demonstrate his empathy with his friend. He'd say things like, darkness is going to read to you now. Art organized his life to help Sandy. One day, Art was guiding Sandy through crowded Grand Central Station when he suddenly said he had to go and left his friend alone and petrified. Sandy stumbled, bumped into people, and fell, cutting a gash in his shin. After a couple hellish hours, Sandy finally got on the right subway train, and after exiting the station at 167th Street, Sandy bumped into someone who quickly apologized, and Sandy immediately recognized Art's voice. It turns out that his trusty friend had followed him the whole way home, making sure he was safe and giving him the priceless gift of independence. Sandy later said, that moment was the spark that caused me to lead a completely different life, without fear, without doubt. For that, I am tremendously grateful to my friend. Sandy graduated from Columbia, then earned graduate degrees at Harvard and Oxford. He married his high school sweetheart and became an extremely successful entrepreneur and philanthropist. While at Oxford, Sandy got a call from Art. This time, Art was the one who needed help. He had formed a folk rock duo with his high school pal, Paul Simon, and they desperately needed $400 to record their first album. Sandy and his wife, Sue, had literally $404 in their bank account but without hesitation, gave his old friend what he needed. Art and Paul's first album was not a huge success, but one of the songs, The Sound of Silence, became a number one hit a year later. The opening line echoed the way Sandy always greeted Art. Simon and Garfunkel, of course, went on to become one of the most successful and beloved musical acts in history. The two Columbia graduates, each of whom has added so much to the world, in his own way, are still best friends. Art Garfunkel said that when he became friends with Sandy, my real life emerged. I became a better guy in my own eyes, and I began to see who I was, somebody who gives to a friend. Sandy describes himself as the luckiest man in the world. It's a great story. And as wonderful as this story is, it doesn't immediately strike one as a Pentecost story. But oh, it is. So Pentecost. Jesus has ascended to heaven, and the apostles are gathered in a room looking down on the streets of Jerusalem. Pentecost is a Jewish festival. The Penta comes from it being 50 years, 50 years, 50 days after Passover, and Jewish pilgrims from every nation in the world crowd the streets. A mighty wind blows through the room where the apostles are gathered, and a tongue of fire alights upon each of them. They step out onto the balcony to address this enormous crowd, and miracle of miracles, each one of these pilgrims hears the apostles speaking in their own language. I've been deeply moved by this scene for years. In fact, Pentecost is one of the defining Bible stories of my faith 
because of its vision of unity in diversity. But I heard this verse a little differently this time. Instead of taking its reference to hearing in their own language literally, I imagined what the experience was like for those present. Each person must have felt uniquely seen, recognized, understood, known, not just for their national origin, but for who they are. Hearing in our own language means that we feel seen, affirmed, validated for all that is good in us. Even when others don't recognize that goodness, even when we are unable to see it for ourselves. Hearing in our own language means that we feel accepted and embraced with our shadows, with our brokenness, shame, failures, and fears. That day in Jerusalem, everyone on the street hears in a language that speaks just to them, just as they are. Being seen, heard, and known in this way can be life-changing, validating us in ways we so need to hear, and accepting, looking kindly upon, loving and forgiving, even the parts of ourselves that we never show anyone. I have found this to be true as a pastor. We all need to be seen and validated for our positive qualities and accomplishments. And we want to be understood, accepted, and forgiven for our limitations, our mistakes, our failures, our sins. This is the work of the Holy Spirit to enable us to be seen, heard, and known just as we are. So though it might be an untraditional Pentecost story, this kind of seeing hearing and knowing is what we find in the story of Art Garfunkel and Sandy Greenberg. When Greenberg lost his sight and was no longer able to see himself as valuable with a contribution to make, Garfunkel became his eyes. Not just physically, but Garfunkel saw Greenberg with the eyes of the spirit to validate his worth and accept him with his limitations. Now, of course, Garfunkel recognizes Greenberg's blindness but he doesn't just see a blind man, but sees his friend not as broken, but as whole. Now we have to be careful about using blindness as a metaphor for negative traits or behaviors. Even the great hymn, Amazing Grace, by singing, I once was blind, but now am found, or I once was blind, <laughs> that's not it. I once was blind, but now I see. <laughs> I try not to be overly bound to my manuscript, but sometimes I should just read what it says. <laughs> I once was blind, but now I see. Equates being blind with sin. Blind people can feel judged in this way. But I think I can fairly say that being human comes with all manners of abilities and disabilities giftedness and limitation. These might be physical, but are also related to our emotional well-being and our behaviors. And as was the case with Greenberg, being blind was not the limiting factor in his life. Rather, it was his perception of himself as broken that caused him to withdraw. He needed Garfunkel to see him as whole and still beloved in order to find new life for himself. This is the gospel message delivered by the apostles on that first Pentecost to all the world's people in their own language. You are whole. You are not defined by your pain, by your limitation, by your sin, but you remain beautiful and good. If I can risk being a little corny, the message of the gospel delivered by the apostles that day was, you've got a friend in Jesus. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus will guide you step by step throughout your life. Like Garfunkel's promise to Greenberg, the Holy Spirit promises us that we will never, ever be alone. But that's not all. Like Garfunkel, the Holy Spirit tells us that we are not meant to be dependent. Like those that Jesus heals, saying to them, stand up and walk, you are made well. Though it was frightening and must have hurt Garfunkel to watch, he recognized that Greenberg could be healed, not of his literal blindness, but of the fear and dependence it had fostered. He invited, challenged Greenberg to stand up and walk. Now June 
is LGBTQ Pride Month. Why pride? Why that word? Well, because too many LGBTQ people still grow up in families and in a culture that communicates a message that being queer somehow makes you broken, a failure at being fully human. Though not true, this message can be internalized in the way that Greenberg's blindness caused him to believe he had been denied a full happy life. Too many LGBTQ people, especially youth, have heard and accepted such messages for themselves, which is why we are an open and affirming congregation and why we proudly display rainbow banners outside the church. Led by the Holy Spirit, we seek to be like Art Garfunkel, knocking on Greenberg's door with the message, this church sees you, hears you, knows you, will learn your language. Lift your head high, stand up and walk. You are a magnificent creation of the divine. So what, what causes you to retreat? What makes you, like Greenberg, want to lock your doors, close yourself off, give up your dreams? What brokenness and shame are holding you in, afraid that if you are fully known, you will be judged or excluded? Where do you, like Greenberg, assume limitations that are of your own making? Like Art Garfunkel to Sandy Greenberg, the Holy Spirit knows you intimately better than you know yourselves. And the Holy Spirit is knocking, saying, come out, set yourself free. I'm not going to allow you to give up on life. Your limitations are of your own making. Stand up and walk, says the Holy Spirit. This was the good news that the apostles delivered to all the world's people on Pentecost all those years ago. I see you, all of you. You are whole. You are not defined by your pain, by your limitations, by your sin, but you remain beautiful and good in God's sight. And notice how the story ends. Sandy then functions as the Holy Spirit for art, changing the way art sees himself. Likewise, we function as the Holy Spirit for each other walking by each other's side, making sure we don't fall as we exit the prisons of our own making. Pentecost provides the spark that invites us to open the door to a completely different life. Open the door that we might be that spark to one another. Amen.
Pastor George's sermon reminded me of a Bible study maybe, I don't know, two or three months ago. Janet Finney was on that Bible study and talked about a dear friend that had passed and talked about um, their bond and how, I think the quote was, um, she knew me, she knew all my flaws and loved me anyway. And um, I thought about that, that quote uh, in that sermon and how um, the Spirit comes to us and loves us anyway. Um, as you can tell, I fought off a cold this past week. I sound a lot worse than I feel. Um, so we've come to this time in our worship together when we share the celebrations and concerns of our lives and our community and our world. And we pray comfort and strength and healing for those who are sick or recovering from surgery, um, including Pat Ketchabal, who's returned home and is uh, on the road to recovery. Uh, prayers for Lori Lemoyne as she continues her cancer journey. And for Marissa Caponetti, as she continues to recover from her surgery, um, there was a piece on her uh, on, on the news this past, this past week. And uh, we'll see if we can maybe put that up on the, on the Facebook page. Um, so uh, about her and her story, but also about how she's raising funds uh, for CCMC for cancer research. Uh, for Abby Harris, of course, as she continues treatment for brain cancer. Always in our prayers is Abby and George and Lourdes. For Karen Pilati, who is facing difficult health care decisions, we pray for her discernment and for successful treatment for her. For Bob Laubin, who continues to recover, and strength for Patty Scanlon. Prayers of solace and peace for uh, Anna Harris and her family on the passing of Anna's mother, uh, Jeannie Folk. For the family of uh, Janet White, Craig White's mother, who passed away at the age of 96 and for Ted and Sandy Christensen, as Sandy continues in hospice care. Of course, for the families um, still reeling um, after the massacre at Robb Elementary School in Texas and the victims of the racist murder in Buffalo, uh, for all victims of shootings, senseless shootings, we pray, and we also pray for action. Pray for wisdom, strength, and courage for the people of Ukraine prayers of wisdom and healing that we may find meaningful ways to channel our anguish and anger over current events with purpose and grace. This one was submitted uh, by a church member. I'll just pray that again. I, I, this really resonated with me. Prayers for wisdom and healing that we may find meaningful ways to channel our anguish and anger over current events with purpose and grace. What prayers uh, do you have this morning? Yes. Yeah, especially on this Pentecost Sunday, that the Spirit uh, may move the people of Ukraine with courage and strength and wisdom to face these challenging, challenging times as they continue on. Thank you. Jim, Mark, Jim, Mark. Jim. <laughs> Reverend George, he looks and sounds great today. There we go. Yeah. Pastor George, all right, celebrate. <laughs> I don't know about the looking great part, Jim, but... <laughs> it's the red, it's the red. <laughs> yes, yeah, Sue. Um, uh, Sarah, a co worker of mine, had a health emergency at West Wednesday. She's having surgery for it tomorrow. Prayers for Sarah? You said Sarah. Okay, she goes through some medical, serious medical time, yeah. Hmm? Yes? Yeah, I want to offer this up probably more as a prayer of thanks than an announcement. I um, have the pleasure of working with one of the greatest groups of volunteers this church has got. And here every Sunday, they back you up on the hymns entertain you during the anthem time. We have undoubtedly one of the best choirs in the Farmington Valley, here, here. if not yes. one of the best. Yes. 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 I want to offer up a prayer of thanks for being able to have the honor of working with these people because they are just great. They are here every week. They're so devoted. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Celebrate. Yes, Joey. God's healing grace and God's angels continue to guide us. Thank you. Don. I'd like to offer a pair of thanks for the most amazing church 
But we say humble too. Yes. <laughs> yes, Aaron. Uh, to my aunt's family whose mother just passed away recently. Oh, to your aunt's family whose whose mother passed away recently. Prayers of comfort and peace. Thank you. For those watching at home, can feel free to write prayers in the comments. Um, and uh, what's, let's now uh, just bow our heads um, in time for our pastoral prayer. The Lord be with you. Holy One, we are not sure what it would look like if the Holy Spirit blew through our churches again as it did on that Pentecost Sunday. However, we want to speak the language that you have given louder and more clearly in our lives and church. And so we pray, come Holy Spirit, come, pour out your fire of love upon us to be the body of Christ in a world that is often hurting, hungry, and cynical. We want to bring the good news to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to captives, bring recovery of sight to the blind, and set at liberty all that are bruised. As your disciples, we pray for all who suffer, are poor, despairing, burdened, blind, battered. In your loving breeze, we pray for health and wholeness for those who are physically ill, for those who are mentally ailing, for those who are money sick, for those who are spiritually unwell. We pray for the healing of your creation, the renewal of the face of the land. We pray for those who are thirsty that they would drink from your fountain of living waters and never thirst again. Amen. Throughout Connecticut, witness stones record the stories of enslaved people from those communities. Uh, history students at Henry James have researched and written a story about Peter, a black man enslaved in Simsbury during the, the mid-1700s. Uh, Cesar was enslaved by a prominent member of the church and community, Andrew Roby. We will gather right here to hear the Henry James students tell his story, and then we will gather for the installation and dedication of his witness stone. So that's right here at 11.30. We mentioned last week that Tom Polizzi will be departing from the First Church staff on June 17th after accepting a new job. So join us next week as we celebrate Tom uh, after the service. Next week is also Confirmation Sunday, so we hope you'll come out to celebrate our 2022 Confirmation class as they officially make their way into the life of First Church. As always, lay readers, acolytes, Bible studies, check the weekly email, check the website. You can see information to sign up or to join. And Vacation Bible School is coming up June 20th to 24th. The volunteer list uh, is looking pretty good, but can always use more. So if you want to work with some kiddos that week, you have free time in the morning, um, you can do that. We'd love to have you join us. We give God thanks for all of the wonderful ministries of this church through which we experience God's love and through which God's justice is made possible, and we ask now all to consider gifts um, to the church as we receive our offerings.
Gracious and loving God, may these our gifts, may all we have to give go in service to being that church, to being your people that see, know, love each other exactly as we are. Uh, may the Holy Spirit move among us here and take these our gifts and put them to your service. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So there are any number of ways that we experience that uh, being known, being seen, being accepted as we are. We experience it uh, from one another, most significantly. Uh, the story that Kevin told about Janet Finney and her friend that knew everything about her and loved her completely. We also experience that um, in, uh, spiritually uh, here at the communion table. Uh, we, we know that through this practice, this spiritual practice of ours of Holy Communion, because it is at this table in sharing the bread and the cup that we are known, that we are seen. Uh, we can't hold anything back at this table. Even if we wanted to, even if we tried, God sees it all and loves us completely. And that is how it's meant to be. So may you find that acceptance and that love here this morning. Welcome to this table, all who seek to follow in Christ's way. We come to this table not because we must, but because we may. We come to this table not to express an opinion, but to seek a presence and pray for a spirit. We come to this table just as we are. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. All who come to me shall not hunger. All who believe in me shall never thirst. With Christians around the world and throughout the centuries, we gather around the symbols of bread and cup, simple elements that speak of nourishment and transformation. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little, you who come here often and you who have not been for a long time. Come with your doubts, come with your hopes, come with your inadequacies and with your strengths. Come not because we invite you, but because Jesus does. It is his hope that those who seek him should meet him here today. Let us pray. Holy One, our loving Creator, you are close as breathing and still as distant 
as the farthest star. We thank you for your constant love, for everything in your creation, and for all that sustains life. We are grateful, O oh God, for all people of faith in every generation, for all those that have come before, for all who have given themselves to your will. We are especially grateful, O oh God, for Jesus Christ, who teaches us how to live out an ethic of justice and peace, and for the calling of your church that keeps his mission alive. We ask you to bless this bread and this cup, and to bless us that as we receive them at this table, we may join with you in promoting the well-being of all creation. In the manner that Jesus taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. On the night he was to be betrayed, when Jesus gathered for a last time with his friends, with his followers, with his disciples, Jesus took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he shared it with his disciples saying, this bread represents my body, my body that will be broken for each of you. He said, take and eat of this and as often as you do, do so in remembrance of me. I offer you the bread. Uh, I offer you this reminder that at First Church, we practice what's called an open table, meaning that um, we would not refuse anyone communion. Um, that is entirely a decision made between you and God. Um, I trust you've received your little communion packet, so I offer you the bread. In the same manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And after giving thanks, he poured it out for his disciples. And he said, drink, each of you. And each time you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. This is the cup of the new covenant, the cup of love. Ministering to you in Christ's name, we give you the cup. Let us stand for our unison prayer of thanksgiving. Thanks be to you, O oh God, for your presence, loving kindness, transforming spirit. May the blessings of this table strengthen our faith, call us to Christ's service, and unify our hearts for Jesus' sake.
You may be seated. Just a couple things before I pray us out. One, one kind of funny, I, I hope. I, it, I just crack up at Jim's comment about that I'm looking and sounding good. Um, you know how Facebook reminds you of things from years gone by, and one just came up yesterday on my Facebook. I think it was from 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when I was at my last church, and we must have done some exercise during worship where we handed out little index cards and people were asked to like write as part of the worship service what they love about the church. And, and this one had said, and I took the opportunity to share it on Facebook afterwards, I love this church because the priest is smoking. <laughs> And people in the comments section took the opportunity to wonder whether it meant like attractive or smoking something. So, <laughs> made me laugh too. Um, and then again, Kevin said it and said it beautifully, but just a reminder that at 1130, we'll be um, installing and dedicating a witness stone. We'll begin here in uh, Palmer Hall, seated right here, uh, Henry James students, perhaps some people from the community, we've been putting it out there on social media, will come and participate in that. The Henry James students will share their presentation about what they learned about Peter uh, Cesar. Uh, this is a um, facsimile, the, the, the permanent one isn't um, entirely completed yet, but it's a very good facsimile. So this, this is what it looks like, and this will kind of drop into uh, pavers right in this little uh, planter that's outside Palmer Hall here, and um, it'll be lovely. In, in time, we will uh, make that installation more permanent. We're going to put a little post with a QR code on it so people can scan it and go to more information. So it's a really cool thing. So as you are able, please uh, linger after worship for that. Uh, we, our fellowship hour will be delayed until after that. So um, if you really, are, really, really want your cup of coffee, your cup of church coffee, then you, then you have to wait a little bit longer for it. So. May the spirit of the living God made known most fully to us in Jesus Christ go before you to show you the way, go above you to watch over you, go behind you to nudge you into places you might not go by yourselves, go beneath you to uphold and uplift you, go beside you to be your strong and constant companion and dwell within you that you may know that you are never, ever alone and that you are loved, loved beyond your wildest imagination. May the fire, may the Pentecost fire of God's blessing burn brightly upon you and within you today and always. Amen.